and take your Bibles tonight. We're going to go to the first book in the Bible, Genesis. So hopefully you didn't just bring your New Testament today. We're in trouble. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And a great truth tonight, hopefully to encourage us as a people of God, also to instruct us on some things that maybe we've not been aware of. Genesis chapter 9. And let's look in beginning in verse number 12 down through verse number 14. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you, every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I'll remember my covenant which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood, to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I'll look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Thank you, Father, for this everlasting covenant, this everlasting promise. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we can gather again tonight around the Word of God. Lord, still our hearts, minds, take away all distractions. Uh, Lord, help us to focus upon you tonight and what you'd have for us. Well, thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. Be seated, if you would, please. I've entitled the message tonight, Man's Need for God's Rainbow. Man's Need for God's Rainbow. Our key verse that we're looking at tonight uh, is in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 13, where God tells us, I do set my bow, and we're referencing the rainbow, I will set my bow in the cloud, it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. One of the most extraordinary and most beautiful wonders of the world is a rainbow. It's a beautiful uh, display of God's uh, handiwork and, and uh, uh, artwork as a sunset would be or a sunrise uh, would be. The rainbow is composed of seven colors, composes a rainbow. It stands out in its individuality of color, yet every uh, rainbow merges with those colors together. It looks like there's only four or five colors, uh, but there's seven colors, and uh, there's a reason why, as we'll see in a moment, that there's seven colors. Those seven colors of the rainbow are violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. We won't look in the significance of all those colors, but those colors all have a significance in Scripture. There's all a purpose behind them. These blended colors, uh, to many observers, uh, we often only see four or five uh, of those colors. It intrigues everybody. It fascinates everybody when you see that rainbow. There's just something beautiful about the rainbow. Now, the rainbow uh, is always mixed with clouds. Uh, you won't see a rainbow if there's not some clouds there. The darker the clouds, it often seems to be the brighter uh, the rainbow. God even says this uh, in the verses that we looked at. Uh, God says, I'm going to, uh, the bow shall be what? In verse eight, 16, in the cloud. And uh, the cloud often represents what? Storms, hardships, trials, difficulties, problems. And uh, the promise of the rainbow is within the midst of the hardships and trials of life. Therefore, man's need for God's rainbow. It's probably, to say, probably safe to say that few humans can see a rainbow and not stop and take a few moments to gaze at it. And uh, you could be driving down the road every now and again. Uh, I've seen on occasion a rainbow that looked like it went from one end all the way to the other end uh, of, of fame. Many times you'll see a half rainbow. Several times I've seen a double rainbow. Uh, well, you'll see a, a rainbow, and there's all types of of uh, reasons, um, uh, phys or, uh, you know, within the science and things of why that's there, the, the, the droplets of, of water and stuff. But the double rainbow is a beautiful where you have the gap between them and another layer of rainbow. I remember um, going to uh, Niagara Falls, and there's always a rainbow uh, around Niagara Falls. As the waters come over the falls in such a strong force, there's a mist that's always shooting up, you know, and, and evaporating up. And with that mist, you can see it from miles away as you're driving. And there's that rainbow uh, that's there. And so the rainbow is an amazing, amazing sight uh, of uh, God's creation. The rainbow has gained much popularity in recent years as homosexuals have adopted it as their logo. Uh, however, God 
has already assigned meaning to the atmospheric beauty, the rainbow. Because as we see in chapter 9, verse 13, look what the Bible says. I do set, notice how, my bow. The rainbow doesn't belong to anybody else. It's God's. And God says, this is my rainbow. Uh, this is my covenant. This is my promise. This is my token of expression of this covenant that I'm entering into uh, with mankind and in fact with all of a creation. It belongs to God. Sadly, when most people think of a rainbow today, they think of homosexuality or the larger LGBT movement and they keep adding letters to that and making it much longer and longer as it goes. But when you see a rainbow, your first thought, even as a Christian, uh, is not a promise of God. Uh, it's not God's covenant with mankind. It's not, that's God's expression of love and greatness and mercy and all the things we'll learn about the rainbow tonight. Uh, the first star of rainbow, God, the Satan has taken something very special and honorable and sacred for a child of God and for God himself and has perverted it. And hasn't he done that with so many different things uh, of our, our world? For example, the word gay. Uh, is it, a good word. It's a word means happy and uh, cheerful. Uh, but we're often hesitant even use the word gay uh, today uh, in regards to the terminology and the ideology that's identified uh, with that word. And the rainbow flag, uh, commonly called the gay pride flag or LGBT pride gay, uh, pride gay flag, uh, is a six-striped rainbow colored flag uh, or multicolored flag it's self-proclaimed symbol of lesbianism gay bisexual transgender and on and on we could go but since there's only one true rainbow it's not a rainbow flag it's a multicolored flag because god says a rainbow's mine it belongs to god and, uh, and so no, I'm not sharing that rainbow uh, with anybody else throughout the Bible. The rainbow symbolized the glory of God, the radiance of God's beauty, the radiance of God's holiness and God's perfection. Remain here in Genesis 9 with a marker. But let me give you a couple of verses to jump to. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 1. And uh, let's look at a few things that God says about this, this rainbow and the glory that's a part of this rainbow. Ezekiel chapter number 1. And look what it says in verse number 28. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse number 28. The Bible says, As the appearance of the bow. That's all about the rainbow. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about it. That was the appearance of the lightness. Notice now, of the glory of of the Lord. And Ezekiel goes on to say, when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice as one, as one that spake. So he talks about the bow in the sky, uh, in the clouds of the sky, and the brightness of the appearance round about it. And he said that appearance, that rainbow is a remind us of something. What's it remind us of? The glory. The glory of God, uh, not uh, uh, some uh, uh, tolerant movement, not, not some uh, 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 advancement, uh, uh, some uh, uh, sodomy and, and some abomination to God, but something that honors God and reverences God and brings glory to God. We see the purpose of the rainbow. Remind Again, let's look at Revelation. We're all the way back to your Bibles. Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter number 10. Again, several times referencing the rainbow and what it represents what it signifies in regards to the glory of God. Revelation chapter 4, look what it says in verse number 3. He that sat was, uh, and he that, that sat was to look upon like jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow. Where was it? Round about the throne, the throne of God, Revelation 4, 3, in sight, like an emerald, he says the glory of God was seen in that rainbow. And where is the rainbow? It was around the throne of God. Go to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 and verse number 1. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as were the sun, and his feet as pillar of fire. And so the biblical rainbow officially has seven colors. The multicolored flag is six colors. Six in the Bible is the number of Satan. Seven is the number of man, or seven is the number of, of God, the Bible, of perfection, of completeness. Six is the number of man, uh, showing the, the, the shortness we come from God. Uh, when we, we miss from the gay pride flag is the color indigo. 
The color indigo is not a part of their six colors. Indigo is the color of royalty, a spiritual knowledge of wisdom, often connecting heaven to earth. And so the LGBT ultimately doesn't want to connect with God. The last thing they want to do is worship God. The last thing they want to do is find wisdom and to understand how God expects them to live. And so six colors for the multicolored flag but seven colors for God's rainbow. Seven's always been the number of colors in a rainbow uh, throughout the centuries. As long as the flag uh, flew, uh, flew less than seven colors, it really isn't a rainbow at all. It's just a multicolored flag. The word rainbow has seven letters in the word. God's rainbow represents his goodness, his mercy, his grace, his love, his long suffering. But most of all, the promise of God that he's trustworthy, he's faithful, he's reliable. You can depend on God. Listen, man's need for God's uh, rainbows. Why? I need God to do what God says he's going to do. The promises of God are reminded and fulfilled. The token of God's fulfillment of his promise is every time you see that rainbow. The true rainbow will never represent nor ever can celebrate any sinful behavior whatsoever. The U.S. Supreme Court, just a side note, ruled in favor of gay marriage. It was on Friday, the sixth day of the week in June, the sixth month of the year on the 26th day of June 666 and we see that the gay flag and uh, uh, the multicolored flag is nothing more it's not a, a, a gay a pride flag it's a, a battle f a, a flag against the righteousness of God and the holiness of God and the goodness of God it's saying God we don't want to do it your way we despise you we mock you and it's that which shames and brings reproach to the name of Christ it's a battle flag that flaunts sexual depravity uh, in all forms of, of, uh, of that's a promoted. It's a flag of intolerance of those opposed to the sinful homosexual lifestyle that mocks the God of Scripture. The Bible still says it's an abomination to God for man to lay with mankind and for woman to lay with womankind. It's an abomination to God. It doesn't change. Now, the sinner that commits a sin, we're to love. We're to reach them. The only hope they have is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Just like the only hope that we've ever had uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, the, the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ where we came to know him as our personal Savior. Now with that, I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 9. Genesis chapter number 9. I want you to break down some of these verses prior to the verse that we've read. Uh, beginning at verse number 12. I want you to go back to verse number 1 of Genesis and just sort of build with this. I'm not sure how far we'll get tonight. Uh, we'll be right on schedule, right on time. But uh, I don't want to go over tonight. But we do want to keep build on this to see what led up to this great promise of God. Man's need for God's rainbow. Look in chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons. And son of them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, upon all the fish of the sea, in your hand they're delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as a green herb have I given you all things. Now verse 1 sounds very similar uh, as a passage because it's what God told Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1. Be fruitful be multiplied. This is Eden, if you would, all over again. God commissions Noah, yes, sins within the land now, but God commissions Noah and his family to spread out across the earth and reestablish the human civilization. Ham, Sham, and Japheth, his three sons, would then now propagate and repopulate uh, the world after it always been destroyed in its entirety, apart from Noah's family, their children, and their wives. All other life uh, was destroyed apart from that which was on the ark. Just as Adam was the head of the human race, so Noah would be the reconstituted human race after the flood. And now God adds one significant permission that was not allowed before the flood. I'm glad that he added this permission. Humans are now given permission to eat animals for food. Amen, that's good. Up until this point, it was all vegetarianism. It was all vegetables. It was all greens. It was all uh, salad. And uh, now God says, hey, uh, now after the flood, I'm giving you permission. He goes on to tell us in verse number three, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as a green herb. And so prior to the flood, it was no meat was allowed to eat. Only vegetables, vegetarian, uh, complete vegetarian diet. Now that the flood comes, 
now meat is available and uh, approved by God. And so we see then uh, that, uh, that statement. Now let's go to verses 4 down to verse number 7. Just going through these verses to where we want to get to our text verse. The Bible says in verse 4, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat? I just said we could eat meat, but now he says we can't. But we'll come back to that. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast. Will I require it at the hand of every man, the hand of every man's brother. Will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, my man shall uh, his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And you be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And so in these verses... No one now learns the rules of the game. And so things are going to be a little bit different than they have been prior to this. And so if God's going to start over again, no one needs to know what the rules are in order to follow it the way God wants it to be followed. And he gives the rules in these several verses. These verses tell us basically there's one rule. Respect life. That's the main rule summarized in these three or four verses that we just looked at. You better respect life. You better respect life. And, and we see that rule divided down into two sub-rules that are given here. The first thing he tells us in verse number four is, I don't want you to eat any living animals that have not had the blood drained from them. And uh, so we see that in verse number four says, but the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, ye shall not eat. And so God's telling the people, or telling uh, uh, Noah here, since God gives permission to eat animals for food, he adds a restriction. They must first be put to death. The blood must be drained before you can eat that animal. And so to violate that was to violate the rule that God established in regards to this now new uh, permission that he was allowing them to eat meat. Secondly, uh, he was to give us a sub-rule to respect life, not just the life of animals, but he also says, I want you to respect the life of each other, human beings, humanity. And he says, murders should be put to death. We see this in verses 5 and 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, the Bible says, by man shall his blood be shed. So if a man sheds the blood of another man by the hand of man, the authority that was given to man to make sure this is carried out was to make sure that that man's life, who took someone else's life, would have his life taken from him, life for life. If you kill, you'll be killed. If you murder, you'll be put to death. If you show disrespect for human life, that you murder it, then you forfeit your own life and the respect of your own life. And so this is the beginning now, biblical foundation of capital punishment. Capital punishment is what? You murder someone, you kill someone, then an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And so that's where it begins here. And so the foundation of that. Now the reason God gave these rules is is crucial. We see it in verse number six. Why was this uh, murder shall be put to death? Uh, I for, you know, if you kill, you be killed. Because man is made in the image of God. Look at verse number six. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God made he man. And so the reason why uh, you ought to respect life is because mankind was made in the image of God. We were made in the image of God, so there needs to be a sacredness, a value of life because of that. And so God says there ought to be something unique and valuable and worthy of respect and honor and protection of life. And so we see the beginning of capital punishment. The image of God means that human life is valuable inside the womb from the very moment of conception. We are created, the Bible says, in the image of God. And so when life begins, we're allow life to run its course. Only God can give life and only God can take life away. We all understand that God's a source of life. He alone has a right to give life and to take it away. But God in this passage delegates authority to protect the sanctity of life to protect the sacredness of made in the image of God. And so there's been delegated authority so that if one man or a person took someone else's life, that delegated authority would make sure that that individual whose life had been taken by this individual, uh, that one that did the murdering, uh, his life would also be taken. Uh, and we'll see several uh, later, and I'll give you several verses here tonight. Uh, in the Old Testament, God gives certain circumstances where the death penalty is justified. 
want to give you in the Bible tonight, and uh, you'll, you'll wonder why uh, there was a little bit greater structure of society uh, back in the Old Testament than there is today. Uh, let me give you a couple of verses here tonight. Uh, when God said death penalty is, is to be expected. Uh, it's, it's justified. Go to uh, Exodus chapter 21 and verse number 12. We'll come back to Genesis here in a moment. But go to Exodus chapter 21 and verse number 12. God takes the sacredness of life very seriously. And uh, God expects us as his representatives on this earth also to, to respect and, and value the significance of life. Exodus chapter 21 verse 12. The Bible says this is when the death penalty was prescribed throughout Scripture. Exodus 21, 12. He that smiteth a man so that he died shall surely, shall be surely put to death. And so when murder was done and a man's life was taken, God said, get him out of here. Get him out of here. We don't want that type of poison in our society. We don't want that type of person uh, within us. There's got to be a consequence that deters the, the anger and the rage in the heart of man so he doesn't follow through and fulfill that. And so the beginning there of capital punishment. Take your Bibles, go to Exodus 35. Exodus 35, God also gives uh, a death penalty uh, under another um, uh, violation of his law. Number one, murder. Number two, look at it says in chapter 35, verse number two. Six days shall work be done. But on the seventh day there shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. So you have the Sabbath. The Sabbath in the Old Testament was Saturday. And so the Sabbath was a day set apart by God. And it was a day of rest. Uh, it was a day even when the manna would come down from heaven uh, to the children of Israel. They would gather a double portion so they would not go out and pick up their, their uh, food and the manna on that Sabbath day. That was set apart to God, sanctified to God. That was a day that belonged to God, worshiping and serving God. And he says, if you work on that Sabbath day, he says, you're going to be put to death. We're talking about motivation to get people to church, huh? And you don't go to church, you're going to you get your head chopped off at the guillotine. But that's what God did on the Sabbath. Uh, now we recognize that that Sabbath law uh, was nailed to the cross. Uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, when he nailed that, the, the ceremonial laws, the dietary laws uh, were nailed to the cross. But the moral laws of God were not nailed to the cross. This was a diet, this was a ceremonial law, the Sabbath. And so that's why we worship God on the first day of the week. Why? That's resurrection. That's when Jesus came forth from the tomb. The resurrected God said, when you assemble on the first day of the week. Now, the seventh day, that first day of the week that God gives us, the, the day of, is also a day of rest. It's not the Sabbath on Saturday that God doesn't want us working on Sunday. Uh, God wants to serve in Him. Worse, it's not the day to wash the car. Uh, it's not the day to, uh, to, uh, to do the laundry. Uh, it's not the day to vacuum the house. Uh, it's not the day to get caught up on things. It's the Lord's day. Now, God's not going to murder you, but we see the significance or kill you. But God gives us significance. Listen, my day, it's set apart. It's important. So important, God says, you break the Sabbath in the Old Testament, you lose your life. It's important you set aside a day for God. Listen, God gives life. God can take life away. Let's look at some other verse. Go to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter number 20. God still uh, has the same uh, thoughts about all of these things. Uh, he's just changed uh, the punishment for them. And, uh, but God's seriousness, we see the seriousness of God concerning these sins uh, as we look at the penalty of death that's been prescribed to them. Uh, look in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. So a murder was to be put to death. Those that worked on the Sabbath were to be put to death. Verse 9 of Leviticus 20. For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely be put to death. Put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. A child disrespects and dishonors their parents. They're gone. They're a goner. And uh, hey, a little bit more respect, a little bit more honoring in the household uh, when your life's on the line. Now, God doesn't uh, do that today, but listen, it's still important to God that we honor our parents. It's still important to God that, uh, that we don't uh, uh, go against our parents and we curse our father and our mother. God says, you curse your parents, you're going to die. It's justifiable. Uh, I wonder how many of us would have made it, amen, through those Old Testament days. Go to Leviticus chapter 20. 
Leviticus chapter 20, just showing you the seriousness of um, sin in the eyes of God. We belittle it. We make fun of it. We, we promote it. Uh, we, we commercialize it. Uh, we put on television. God says you ought not to be making uh, light of that. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Adultery was the death penalty. God said, if you've been unfaithful to your spouse, you and the one you've been unfaithful with, both will die. That's why, remember when Jesus, they took that woman that was taking adultery and they surrounded her and they were ready to throw stones at her. Remember, they were, they were doing what the Bible said to do, partially. And then Jesus stooped down and wrote something in the ground. I maybe think he maybe wrote this verse in the ground. He says, listen, if she's taken, you took her in the act of adultery, and you want to stone her, which is what the law says to do, where's the man that was a part of that uh, uh, relationship? It might have been someone in a, in a religious position. It might have been someone high up in the church. It might have been someone that was a political, uh, renowned individual that, that we didn't want, want to expose them to that type of uh, uh, embarrassment. And that's why that one by one they began to walk away, remember? Uh, because to do it biblically, they should have taken both the wife, or the, the woman, and, and the man that had committed that adultery and put it down. You say, well, is that, that's not a punishment right now. No, but God still sees it as very serious. God still sees it as very serious. Uh, God doesn't uh, belittle it. God doesn't minimize it. Uh, God doesn't look down upon it. God doesn't ignore it because that's not the point. Listen, if God says that death is going to happen, then they'll be less likely to do that. See, much of our problem in our penal system uh, today is there's no uh, consequences uh, that, uh, that detour the crime that is committed. In fact, they're releasing 60 to 70,000 uh, criminals uh, out of California uh, because the jails are overpopulated because they want to make room for all the pastors and all the Christians. They're in defiance of all their mandates. And don't think that that's uh, making light of that at all because that's the direction our countries are going. Our country's going. And uh, they'll let the criminals and the, 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 uh, uh, those folks out to make room for guys that are arresting Canada that's standing for God and, and uh, all within our area and they're arresting them and finding them within our country. Don't think it won't happen uh, with us. And so we see adultery uh, is something that would bring about uh, this saying God hates it. Let me give you another verse. Go to Leviticus chapter 20, same chapter. Go down to verse number 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman... Both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Uh, God says homosexuality. God calls it sodomy. Sodomy. Uh, sodomite. Uh, God says put them to death. Put them to death. We don't want that poison in, in our culture. Just as much as a murder. Just as much as someone that's working on the Sabbath. Just as someone that's cursing their mom and dad. Just someone that's committing adultery. We don't want that type of scene in our culture. And he says we're going to get rid of them. Notice it says an abomination. Uh, what was an abomination to God then is still an abomination to God today. Sodomy is an abomination to God. The sin of Sodom is an abomination to God. God hates it. And it was a destroying of, of um, Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's where we get the term Sodomite as a result of that. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. It's amazing how many times God says, uh, this is the death penalty. This is when I want you to give the death penalty. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 25. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse number 25. But if a man find a betrothal damsel, betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. What's that? That's rape. That's rape. God says someone sees a, a betrothed a damsel, that's a, a, a young lady that's engaged, or a young, young lady in the field, and, and uh, the man forced her. God says, put him to death. Not the lady, not the girl, but the man. Rape, God says, I hate it. I hate it. And uh, kill him. Get him out of here. I don't want it. Let's look on. Go to Exodus chapter 21, verse 16. Exodus chapter 21, verse 16. The Bible says in Exodus 21, 16, it says, And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. Kidnap him put to death. Human trafficking, big, big, uh, put to death. Uh, look at God. God said these are, these are serious sins 
that requires serious consequences, and we now just give a little pat on the, bat, bat on the hand, and uh, you're all right, it's not that big of a deal, everybody else is doing it, just don't get caught, and it's all right. Hey, these are things that God says it's wrong, so wrong, that I want to eliminate that person from my people, and we're going to eliminate him through death, the death penalty. I'll give you one more. Go to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, and there are several verses here I want you to see. This is an interesting thought. Um, I've used it many times uh, over the years of my life, but you may not know this verse. It's a great one. Exodus chapter tw 21, and uh, look with me down in verse number 21, uh, verse number 22, I'm sorry, down to verse number 25. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished, according as the wo wo woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So God says, all right, there's two men that are quarreling, they're fighting. And a woman's there, a, a pregnant woman's there. And somehow she gets in there trying to separate her, whatever she might be there. She's in the room. And something happens to where she with child is, is pushed over or rolls over, whatever. But something that could have caused a miscarriage of the baby. But the Bible goes on to say here uh, in this verse... Uh, that uh, if, uh, so that her fruit, where it says, um, um, that's where we're at in verse, what did I say, verse number 22, where it says, so that her fruit depart from her, yet no mischief follow, uh, and then he shall be surely be punished. And so talking about uh, in regards to uh, the baby, whether that baby lives or dies, verse 23, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. So if that baby does not die because of being pushed or however she was, involved in this altercation, then the husband of that woman would then determine with the judges what would be the proper punishment, the fine, the fees, the cost that would need to be done to make sure that this was satisfied in the eyes of the husband. If that fruit uh, of that seed of, the, of that child, that child was killed uh, as a result of uh, that accidental push, it wasn't purpose, was on purpose. It was an accidental. They're fighting on purpose. A woman gets in the mix of it somehow. She gets pushed in a way where it could harm the baby accidentally, and the baby dies. Okay, the baby dies. As a result, what the Bible says, uh, the Bible says, if any mischief follow, then that thou shalt give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If any man smite, if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out of his manservant's tooth or his maid's, it goes on and uh, looks at here. So it's interesting, we look at these verses, it's interesting under the Mosaic law. If anyone caused an accidental death of another adult, of another adult, this criteria was not applied. So if there's an accidental death of another adult, uh, it wasn't intentional, then it wasn't he had to die. But there's a much higher standard for the baby inside the womb that that little baby dies. Why? Because life begins at conception. It's not a fetus. Uh, it's not some uh, conglomerate of, of, of cells and tissues there, and then it becomes a baby. It's life. It's life at conception. And God says, if anything happens, that little baby, then the, then the one that caused accidentally caused this woman to fall or, or to go down the stairs or whatever, and the baby dies, then the life of that man will be taken. The life of that man will be taken. If the accidental killing of a preborn child in ancient Israel is a serious matter in the eyes of God, then don't you imagine an intentional killing of a defenseless person in the womb is much more? Various to our Savior? If he hated it and caused death to the one that accidentally brought harm, death to a baby, how much more to these abortionist doctors and these others that are intentionally bringing death to the babies on the inside? God views a preborn child as a precious person, a human being within the womb as a baby. And he looks at it uh, right there as we see these verses here. So God sees all these things about why is this so important? Because we're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. Life, and so the theme of these verses we're looking at, respect life. 
Respect life. Uh, don't just go out and shoot animals for the sake of animals, but for the sake of, of providing for yourself, whether clothing or food or nourishment or for your family, whatever it is, that's fine. God says you're allowed to do that. And don't eat it without having the blood been, been drained from it. And uh, it's not a cannibalistic type of thing, a very demonic uh, ritual type of thing there. And so God says, I view life. And so seven, eight things we've looked at where God says the death penalty is okay in these, these areas. Can you imagine what our, our society would look like if we implemented these in our society? Many of us wouldn't even be here tonight. We wouldn't be here. But I'll tell you what, we'd have a society that had a fear of God. The being of wisdom is a fear of God. We'd have a families that understood the significance of honoring mom and dad. We'd have a, a culture that realized, listen, I better do what I was born a, a boy. I was born a girl, and I better keep it that way. Why? Because if not, boy, there's a consequence that's going to come as a result of that. I better stay faithful in my vows to my husband, to my wife. Because if not, it's not just I'm sorry, it's death. And so God saw this as very serious. And so let's go back to Genesis now. And again, you said, what's that do the rainbow? Nothing, but it's in the same chapter, amen? So we're just going, going through it, building up to this and uh, seeing the promise of God through this whole thing. So Genesis chapter 9, and uh, look in verse number 8. The Bible says, And God spake unto Noah and his sons with him, saying, And we'll go, and I'm not going to read all these verses here. Uh, we read them a moment ago, but this uh, describes what's called the Noahic Covenant. The Noahic covenant. There's several covenants that God made with mankind. Uh, this is the Noahic covenant. And so that's N O A H I C, pronounced Noahic covenant. Now, the covenants in the Bible are the permanent legal transactions that God made with various individuals and that, he ex that were extended to their descendants. There was often a token that was given tied to that covenant. And we're not going to look at all the covenants for the sake of time tonight, but whatever those covenants were, there was always a token that signified, this is my promise to you, God's promise to us and to your descendants uh, that would come after us. And so, to the contrary, so God didn't say if, so, so this covenant was an unconditional covenant. Uh, it wasn't dependent upon us doing anything. It was all God. And uh, there wasn't an if you obey me, I promise never to flood the earth again. It didn't say if you offer sacrifice, I promise I'll never flood the earth again. To the contrary, God asked nothing of mankind. God says this is a, a covenant, Noah, that I'm entering into with you and with your descendants. That's, we're a part of that uh, ancestry now as we look back uh, to that uh, descendants. He says this is something that no obedience, no sacrifice, no faith, no prayer, nothing at all. There's nothing you've got to do. Most sometimes in the Bible God says you do this, I'll do this. You do this, I'll do this. You do your part, I'll do my part. But in this sake, God says no condition. It's a promise I give you, no more floods. No more floods. And the rainbow, as we'll see, uh, will be a token or the, the reminder of my promise to you to never again destroy this world uh, by water in a flood. And so the promise is made by God in spite of the fact that the world has just been destroyed because of sin. I mean, it just, it's just a short time that God destroyed everything. And he's just got a handful of people starting all over again. And God, and God knowing that sin is going to just raise its head right up again and all the problems that would soon come very quickly uh, even after everything had been purged. And so even in spite of all that, God said, I'm going to make a promise. It's a covenant of pure grace in spite of our sin, not because of any supposed human goodness on our part or human faith or human obedience. In spite of our continuing to sin, God promises the entire human race, I will not ever again, ever flood this world and destroy this world ever again. And the rainbow will be that everlasting covenant we see in verse, look in verse number 16, where he says, and um, the bow shall be in the cloud, and you'll look upon it that I remember, and what? It's an everlasting covenant. It's a promise that never ends. Sin will abound, but that covenant of promise will never, never, never be disannulled. It'll never uh, pass away. It'll never uh, get old or, or outdated. It's a perpetual, the Bible says in verse 12, that uh, no matter how wicked the world becomes, it'll be a covenant of um, a promise to you under what the Bible says, perpetual 
generations. He said it'll just go generation after generation. Now we're perpetually all the way down these, this road uh, to where we are today. And now we still see the rainbow. Not to be the first thought of gay pride or the first thought of homosexuality, but man's need for God's rainbow. We need God's rainbow to remind us in times of storms and hardships and trials and difficulties. And you see that rainbow, it's God's reminder to say, what I say I'm going to do, what I promise I'm going to fulfill, uh, what, I, what I say I'm going to accomplish, it's going to come to pass. You can take it, you can mark it down. Notice also the Noah covenant uh, will last forever. It's a perpetual generation. But notice in verse 15, every living creature of all flesh. So God doesn't just give this promise to us as human beings. He gives it to every bird, every beast, every wild animal, every living creature of all flesh. Why does he do it for all perpetual generations? For our peace of mind. For our peace of mind. You see, man needs to be able to worry and enjoy life without worrying every time it starts to rain. That I wonder if God's going to flood the world again. You see, remember the earth was protected by a water vapor canopy, they had never seen rain before the flood. They had never seen it before. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, in um, Genesis chapter 2 and verses 5 and 6 talks about the mist that watered the earth. And they'd wake up the morning like we do, the dew that's on there. But there was enough dew that would be able to get to the roots and able to really water it. But there was ne they never knew what rain was. And so that's why when Noah's out uh, building the ark and they said, what are you doing? I'm building a boat. What for? Uh, for a flood. What's that? Well, that's water's coming from the sky. What's that? We've never heard that before. And, and so when that first drop came, what was that? They had no idea what that was. And, and so they, they, because God had always watered, uh, there, was that, there was a protective vapor, water vapor canopy that gave the world a semi-tropical uh, climate uh, that, was, that was perfect living conditions. They had not known rain. And that, made the, that was very benign weather to them. Uh, they were in a protected kind of environment where the ultraviolet rays of the sun could not get through uh, that vapor canopy. That's why they lived to be eight, nine hundred, almost a thousand years old. They didn't have that radiation coming through. That vapor canopy was there. And animals lived to be very, very old, hence reptiles. The animals that grew all their life became dinosaurs. And they just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. Why? Because life was, was in a, this subtropical climate. And this, this vapor ca uh, canopy uh, insulated them from all of the impurities of, of the, the radiation of everything. Uh, ultraviolet light, all that stuff out there. It was a perfect environment. And so at the flood, it rained for the first time. The Bible says the earth exploded. The gas and materials went forth and, and, and the, the canopy opened up like a, like a, like a waterfall and water gushed uh, out of heaven and, and the, the earth opened up the, the reservoirs within itself and, and began to fill in for 40 days and 40 nights. It rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. They got in the boat, God shut the, the ark, and God shut the, the door and the ark, and, and uh, water covered every aspect of the entire planet. Now, in this new world, that they are now on dry ground, rain would be a new thing. It would be a normal thing. It would be something that would always happen now, this new rain, because that vapor canopy had been opened uh, as the waters came forth. Through that canopy, uh, it was no longer that protective barrier and people began to live less and less and less as we look until we are today as we've shot rockets through and satellites and all the things that have penetrated that canopy that's been all around us uh, and uh, over these, these years and, and exposed us to all of these um, different radiation type of things uh, through the sun. And so God now moves the water in a hydro, hydro, hydrological cycle. And so now the waters are evaporated in the ocean. The clouds cover them, in, carry them inland. And uh, rain comes forth, fills the, the rivers and the reservoirs and the lakes and goes back to the ocean. And this, this cycle begins to, it's a normal cycle. They had never known that before, uh, the flood. And now after the flood, this would be very normal. Rain will now be common. But Noah didn't know that. Put yourself in Noah's shoes. He didn't know that. If you were to be a reporter and you came to Noah and says, Noah, tell me what you think of the rain. All Noah knew of the rain 
was it was devastating, destructive, and it wiped everything out. I mean, if you were to ask Noah what he thought about the rain, the one time it rained, he had to get in a boat and was there over a year. You mentioned rain to Noah. Uh, it covered all the land, deposit on the land, fall, uh, all over and everything died. And uh, uh, rain wasn't common. And so uh, his experience was rain was severe. I'm 600 years old, he says. And, and I said, I've seen it rain once, one time. And it has been devastating. And so the thought of rain was frightening to Noah. He was paralyzing. I'm sure when he felt that first drop, he was ready to grab his wife and says, hey, we got to get in the boat again. It's raining. Because that's all he knew about rain. And so when God shows up to give this promise, he was given the reassurance to Noah and to all generations, whenever it rains, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to fear, Noah, rush into the ark, because I promise you that rainbow is going to be a reminder. I'm never again going to ever destroy the world by a flood again. Don't worry, Noah. It will rain. Rain will be a part of your life. There will never be a worldwide devastation such as the first rain that you experienced. So it was a covenant with all humanity, but it was also a covenant with Noah. Take your Bibles and go to Isaiah 54 and verse number 9. Isaiah chapter 54, verse number 9. Noah had never seen what had taken place. His family had never seen what had taken place. And we see in Isaiah 54, 9, the Bible says, For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. He said, this is all like really new. I don't know what you're talking about. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I would not be wroth with thee nor rebuke thee. Just as God's storms will come and the chasing hand of God will come, God says, you don't have to fear. It won't be all-inclusive. It won't be for the entire duration. He says, more than anything, I want to give you love and forgiveness and a second chance and renewal and restoration. I want you to have a fresh start and to do it all again. So God says, it won't, I won't do it again. Not that you don't deserve it, but I promise I won't do it again. You, you deserve it. We deserve to be flooded again and again and again when we look back in the history of America. But God promises to be merciful to all of humanity. He'll let man choose to go into sin. And in God's patience and forbearance, in this age of mercy and grace, this perpetual promise that's an unconditional reminder of God's wondrous grace and mercy. And so when you see that rainbow in the sky, it's nothing more than a reminder that we deserve the judgment of God. We deserve the wrath of God. We deserve the anger of God. But God is mercy and love and kindness and patience. He withholds it. And we can say, what a loving God. He is faithful. He is true. He is reliable. He is dependable. In verse 16 in Genesis, it says, And the bowl shall be in the cloud. I'll look upon it, then I remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature, the flesh that is upon the earth. Notice now, it's not only a reminder to us, it's also a reminder to God. He says, God says, I will look upon it. Well, God's omniscient. God's all-knowing. Why would God need to be reminded? Oh, God is all-knowing. God doesn't need to remember. But God's saying this to give us an added assurance to His promise. It's not just to remind you that I won't destroy the world by a flood. It's also to remind you that it's going to remind me that I'm not going to destroy the world by a flood. It's for your benefit that I said that. The promise, it won't flood. The pledge, the rainbow in the sky. I'm going to take the, the remaining 10 minutes that we have. I'm going to give you three or four points as we look at the Sermon on Nature, the rainbow, and a couple of lessons that we can learn is about from the Word of God about the rainbow. What it should remind us of? Man's need for God's rainbow. When you look at the rainbow, I don't want you to think of the, uh, the, the sodomy and homosexuality when you see someone uh, that has a rainbow. That's your natural thought, even as a Christian, sad to say. I want you to be reminded of this. Uh, when you see the rainbows in the sky. Number one, the rainbow speaks of the power of God. The power of God. Uh, when you see the, the bow in the sky, it tells us what God's like. He's great. 
He's powerful. Psalm 91 said, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth His handiwork. How great is He? How small are we in contrast? Isaiah 4.22 says, It is He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. The inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, and stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. The rainbow speaks of the greatness. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, God has created some great things. That's the God we serve. He's a powerful God, an omnipotent God. And the rainbow reminds us, God, you are more powerful than the sin that tries to conquer me. You're more powerful than the enemy that tries to destroy me. God, you're more powerful. The rainbow, when you're discouraged and weak and weary and well-doing, you look at the rainbow and says, God, you're all powerful. Thank you for your power. But not only does it remind us of God's power, the rainbow also speaks of the perfection, the perfection of God, the perfection of God's handiwork declares the perfection of God's character. The rainbow is not only flawless, but it's indescribably beautiful and majestic in its splendor. God's handiwork is so perfect. What must God be like? What must God be like? A powerful God who's not perfect in all His ways would be a menace. He would be cruel and vindictive. But our God, He's powerful and He's perfect. And the perfection of His character controls and dictates and exercises the operation of His power. Everything He does is perfect. Everything He does is right. Everything He does is true. Everything He does is the way it should be. Why? The rainbow. Power. The rainbow. He's perfect in all that He does. Our God is not only powerful, He's perfect. He's not only unerring in His wisdom, but He's loving. He's not only just and holy and righteous, but He's gracious and full of compassion. The rainbow, the power of God, the perfection of God. I think the rainbow also speaks of the promises of God. Genesis 9, we learn that the rainbow was a guarantee given by God Himself. He would never, never, ever destroy the world by a flood. And so this book is a book of promises. And what God says, he'll do. He'll fulfill. He'll carry it out. And so God said, I want you to understand, if I say, well, God, you haven't done it yet. Oh, but I'm going to do it. Because I said it. Settled. It's settled. We say, I, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Whether I believe it or not, it's settled because God said it. Uh, I hope we believe what God said. But that didn't determine whether or not God's going to be able to do it or not. Uh, we see that. So the power of God, the perfection of God, the promises of God. Uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And then lastly, may I say the rainbow speaks of the purposes of God. It's a twofold purpose. Every time you see a rainbow, it's judgment and grace. It's judgment and mercy. God says the rainbow's showing up when the clouds come. Where there's no clouds, there's no rainbow. He says they're going to come together. The rainbow speaks of God's grace. The cloud speaks of God's judgment. All the way through human history, these two are placed side by side the rainbow and the cloud, grace and judgment. Throughout the Bible, read of God's condemnation, man's sin, the cloud. But always side by side, we see God's love for mankind and his willingness to deliver him and save him, the rainbow. God punishes sin for he's a holy God, but God also is merciful and loving. To the believer, there's a rainbow in every cloud. I don't know the trials you're going through today, but there's a rainbow that God wants you to grab a hold of. You say, preacher, I don't know how much longer I can hang on. I don't know how much longer I can keep trusting. I don't know how much longer I can keep on serving God and believing in God. There's a rainbow. And you look to that rainbow. And let that be a reminder to God, to you, that's saying, listen, for every cloud, there's a rainbow. That's God's presence. That's God's power. God's purpose being accomplished. God's perfection. The promises of God being fulfilled. God's in this part. For the sinner, under the wrath of God, the cloud is there for a rainbow with a freeness of salvation that's made available to you through Jesus Christ. You're under the judgment, the dark cloud of sin, but the rainbow is there to deliver you. For the child of God today under the cloud of God's chastening hand, working in your life, as it says in 1 Peter 4.12, but in this cloud there's a rainbow promise of the all-sufficiency of God's grace to forgive and to cleanse and to restore. I don't know where you're at today in your life, but we need God's rainbow. We need God's rainbow. And when you go home today and maybe these next several days, you'll see a rainbow. I want you to just sit back and pull over on the side of the road and just look and think about, wow, God, that was your unfailing, perpetual promise, unconditional promise that you gave to us. And we're still being reminded of it that you'll do what you say you're going to do. God, you're a powerful God. 
You're a perfect God. I don't understand why everything's going on in my life, but I know you do everything perfect. You're powerful. You're perfect. And God, there's a purpose you're trying to accomplish in my life. And God, uh, you're wanting to uh, do the promises that God fulfilled in my life. And God, I want to trust you. Here's the last verse. I'm done. Go to Isaiah 55. I want all of us to turn there and we'll be done. Isaiah 55, and we'll look at just two verses. Can you see God's rainbow of mercy and love in your life? Or do all you see is the dark clouds? You just see the dark clouds and complain and gripe and murmur and feel sorry for yourself? Or are you looking for the rainbow? And you don't need to see much rainbow, but you see a little spark, a little, little segment of the rainbow. It'll bring joy to your heart. You got it? Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God. Oh, I like this. For he will abundantly pardon. God says you got to look for the rainbow in whatever dark clouds you're in right now. Those dark clouds may be self-inflicted storms in your own life. It may be caused by your own choosing. And God says, I want you to seek me out and look for a rainbow. And God says, I'm not just going to pardon you. That would be great, huh? A part, you want to pardon? God says, I'm gonna, I don't know what an abundant pardon is, abundantly pardon, but it's certainly much better than a pardon. I'm going to abundantly pardon you. And uh, I want God in my life, I want God in our lives uh, to be reminded as we look and go through life and we look and see the rainbow. Don't let the devil and the sodomite crowd take what God wants to encourage us and pervert it, defile it. You allow and you look and say, Father God, thank you for being God. Thank you for being my God. And thank you, God, for always being true to your word. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the truths. The little insights of nugget that we received tonight as we looked at a few verses in the book of Genesis chapter 9. Lord, we saw the seriousness of sin and the consequences of death that you placed upon those sin. Now that's not the consequence today upon those same sins. But that doesn't mean that you look less seriously upon those sins. You are just as opposed to those sins now as you were then. I pray, dear God, that we would also see the sins in our life as serious. The Lord's day is set apart for you. That's, that's, that's serious to you. It may not be serious to us, but to God it's serious, the Lord's day. It's not an extra day to do what we want to do and get caught up on the errands and projects and things that we've got behind on and everything else. It's set apart for you. The life of others are sacred to be respected. Lord, all these things we look at in Scripture. And then that great promise of that token that you put in the sky, in the cloud, to remind us, Noah, when it rains, you don't have to run for the ark. You can know that I'll do what I promised to do. I'll never destroy the world by a flood again. And you can rest assured tonight, Christian, that God promises I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You can trust the promise of God that to the token of the rainbow that God will not give you more than you can handle, that you can bear. You can trust God that he'll give the strength and the wherewithal to do what he requires of us to do. Lord, let's just trust you each step of the way. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed tonight. If we're looking around, no one talking as the pianist plays our song of invitation. Let me ask you a question. If you died right now, do you know for sure heaven's your home? Do you know Christ is your Savior? Get that nailed down. You say tonight, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't know for sure I'm saved. I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven. I certainly don't want to be under the wrath of God. I, I want that rainbow to be part of my life. I promise I can be saved if I trust him to be my Savior. But tonight with an uphill down, say, Pastor, I don't know. I don't know for sure. I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to know that. Would you pray for me? In your life that I won't get there. All right, thank you for your honesty. God bless you. How about it, Christian? Do you see sin the way God sees it? Are you in a storm tonight? You need to see a rainbow in your storm. Remind you of God's power, God's promise, God's perfection, God's purpose, God's presence. Father, bless us tonight. 
You speak to our hearts. You work in our lives. In Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.